Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'm going to continue and maybe even conclude this series on work. Um, I desperately want us to see how every part of our life comes under the lordship of Jesus. My passion as a pastor and as a parent is to make disciples, to see people grow in their discipleship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of our discipleship is learning how to bring the totality of our lives under his lordship and serve him in every facet of our life. That's been my attempt in this series, is to show us how our work matters in the grand scheme of God's big story of redemption and reconciliation and God recreating, reclaiming, and remaking the world. And our work in the present can move that agenda forward for God's future, where in the end, we have the victory where God um, remakes the world in new heavens and new earth, new creation, and we anticipate that by living in our day-to-day -day lives, working for Jesus, in our jobs, working for Jesus, and every part of our life being a way we worship Him and work with Him and for Him. And so last week, I began to give uh, some criteria for how to understand our work, that as Colossians 3 says, we work for Jesus and that any kind of work that we work for him qualifies uh, as work that glorifies God, that is dignified and brings honor and glory to Jesus. And so we need to see, uh, we need to have a framework for how we uh, see our day-to-day -day jobs working for Jesus, that as disciples of Jesus, Jesus is the center of everything. And how do we center our work around Jesus? Last week, I just hit number one, which was, does it provide? Does our job provide for our basic needs and those under our care? And what Paul instructs us in 2 Thessalonians is that those who are able to work, but not willing to work, that they shouldn't receive the fruit of other people's labor. But those who work, are able to work, and desiring to work, that that is dignified, that that kind of work glorifies God. And that doesn't include people who are able or not able to work, uh, but would desire some help, that, that we need to take care of them. Uh, it's only if you are able and not willing. And I get that uh, the economy can take a turn or maybe that business closes or maybe that there's massive layoffs and there's seasons where people who are able to work um, but they're not able to find a job. They're willing to work, but they're just not able to find a job. That's not the same thing. It's those who are able to work and that there is a market where they can get work but are not willing. That's where we have a problem. And so we need to see our work. The first criteria for our work, working for Jesus, is does that job provide? Does it provide for our basic needs and the needs of those who are under our care? And so let me jump to the other ones. We're gonna go five questions. That was number one. Second question. Is it honest? This speaks to the selection of our work. Is it honest? Is our work honest? What do I mean by that? Um, what does God want us to do for work? What is work that glorifies God? As we saw in Colossians 3, anything, any kind of work that is honest, um, work that isn't sin. If our work is sin, we should I, well, I'll get to that. Ephesians chapter four, verse 28 says this. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. That, that manual labor is dignified, okay? It's not, I, I know that in our world today, there is what's called knowledge work, or many people work with their minds. And honestly, I'm still figuring this out and working uh, through how to understand knowledge work, but there is dignity in working with our hands. He says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. Let him go to work, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Uh, this is reminding us that our work is for more than just for survival. It's also for sharing. Work is to be an other-centered activity in our lives. What he's saying is that the thief doesn't need to center everything around themselves and just try to steal what is going to provide for them. That's dishonest. But honest work is work you're doing that provides and that isn't sin, 
but also you have something not just for yourselves, but for, for others to share. Remember, work is not just for survival, it's for sharing, and this is what Paul's referring to here. Now, I get it that there's much about our work and our economy uh, that is outside of our control. We may work in businesses that make poor decisions uh, that we don't have any say over. Uh, and due to sin, there are many of those decisions in our commerce and in our economy that are not scriptural. They dehumanize people and deface creation. So let me give you two clarifying questions about if your work is honest or not. Two questions, and then I'll explain them. The first question is, what I am doing being done to the best of my ability? So in thinking about honest work, is what I'm doing for work, am I doing it to the best of my ability? The second question, is what I'm doing worthy of being done? You know, is it sin? <laughs> is, is what is my work worthy of being done? Uh, and so let me clarify those. The first one, is what I'm doing being done to the best of my ability? Am I able to glorify God in my work? Am I, am I putting, as Colossians 3, 20, 23 says, I, can I work heartily? Am I putting my heart and soul into my work for God's glory? If your work is primarily about personal fulfillment, you being fulfilled by your work, then you will most likely not work to the best of your ability until you get your dream job or that external factors of your job accommodate your personal feelings or your personal fulfillment. So let me just tell you, that it's highly unlikely you will be working in your ultimate dream job. And even if you get your dream job, it's most likely it's not all what you think. I'm not sure there is a job out there that 100% of your tasks and responsibilities are totally fulfilling and enjoying. I think you'd be in a great job if 80 to 90% of what you're doing, you enjoy. That would be a great job. There's 10 to 20, maybe 25% of your work, no matter how good the job is, that you're responsible for doing things that just are not that fun. Now, if your work is like 50%, you just hate, uh, you need to maybe pray a little bit, but uh, that's a different subject. Let me hit the subject of your attitude. Is what you're doing, whatever you're responsible for at work, are you doing it to the best of your ability? Luke 16, 10 says, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If you cannot work to the best of your ability in your current job, with your current tasks, however menial or boring or unfulfilling they may be, you will never learn how to be faithful at a higher level of work or responsibility. It's just the way it is, that you have to learn faithfulness in the little when things aren't easy or they seem petty or menial or um, unfulfilling. Uh, not all work is fun. In a post-fall, the fall of man world, a lot of our work is toil. It's hard. It's hard work. Much of our work is not fun. Uh, you may not love what you're doing, but are you doing it to the best of your ability for God's glory? We can bring Christ into our work, bringing meaning and purpose in the most menial tasks. There's a book I highly recommend uh, if reading tiny little books are your thing um, by Brother Lawrence. And this is from hundreds of years ago. There was a book written about and a little bit from Brother Lawrence, this little monk who was lame in one leg about how he infused every moment of life in intimate fellowship with God and, and developed uh, an incredibly intimate uh, uh understanding of God's presence and fellowship with God. And you know what his job was? Washing dishes and repairing shoes. 
And he found the greatest fulfillment in these small little tasks, not because of the task themselves, but he recognized that every moment is a moment where we can fellowship with God and recognize his presence. And now, hundreds of years later, this tiny little crippled uh, monk that is washing dishes and repairing shoes is influencing people. Imagine that. People are trying to be influencers today and they're trying to get their brand out there, get their name out there, build a name for themselves and get their, what they recommend, uh, what they influence people. They wanna influence people by being loud and being provocative or, or, or giving thoughts. And yet this quiet little monk hundreds of years ago, I think is influencing more people and how to understand the smallest little tasks, however menial or boring they might be, is a moment to infuse with God's presence, with meaning and with purpose. And so what is, the, what is our witness at work? Are we witnessing in such a way that because I just don't feel like working very hard, That's, because remember, everywhere you go as a follower of Jesus, you are witnessing of Jesus. So is the witness we have one of apathy or lethargy? Um, Are we cynical or critical about everything? Uh, what, what, What is our witness at work? Are we just disengaged just because we don't feel like it? Listen, if we're followers of Jesus, we are not tyrannized by our feelings. We're not controlled by our feelings. We don't let feelings control us. We control our feelings because we are living for Jesus, not just by our feelings. So our witness of work is we are to do our work to the best of our ability, even if the work itself might seem menial or boring or unfulfilling. Then the second question is what we're doing worth being done? And where areas of biblical morality are being violated, uh, you need you need to ask this in that realm to know whether you should leave that company or that job or not. If if what you're doing, the expectation of your job is to violate biblical morality, sin, then you should ask this question and think about uh, whether you should stay or not. And you should trust God if it's to move to a different job. You should trust God to provide for you because, man, if what your work is is considered is sin, then you can quit and trust God will provide for the next the next opportunity to work. And it might not be your dream job next, but it is moving you in the direction of his plan and his glory so that we're not perpetuating sin and brokenness and evil in this world. The third question to help us get a criteria for work And that is, does our work contribute? Does it contribute? This speaks to the motivation of our work, what motivates us. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 24 says, all things are lawful. And Paul is here quoting people who have kind of an attitude. And so he quotes them saying, well, all things are lawful. And he says, but not all things are helpful. Well, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Our society demands you seek your own good or the good of your tribe, whatever that tribe is. And there is no biblical precedent that gives us the right to pursue our work for our own fulfillment and good only. Now, we can pursue work that is personally fulfilling and good for us, but that's not our primary motivation. Our motivation should be, does it contribute to the good of my community, my market, my customers, my uh, clients? Does my work contribute not just for my own good? Paul here is reminding this church in Corinth, you do not live for yourselves. You do not live self-centered. We live Jesus-centered, which means we then have an other's mind. We are mindful about others and what's good for them. And so does my job contribute to the good of others? Is what I'm doing, doing, am I doing it for my own good, concerned about how it could be, or am I concerned about how what I do can be used for God's kingdom and for his glory? Uh, Many are tyrannized by the desire to possess the right to your own life and to your own satisfaction. But that kind of pursuit 
leaves us restless and will never be fully satisfied. For the workaholic, the one who lives self-centered with work at the center, uh, you will work harder to possess more and more and more, and there will never be enough. To the sluggard, you will do whatever it takes to just maintain. That's not contributing. It's selfish and it's self-centered. And you're gonna, you're tyrannized by the desire to get out of more work. Our motivation for work is a heart issue. And we need hearts that are governed and controlled and uh, centered for the love of from the love of God. Second Corinthians chapter five. Paul says, it's the love of God that constrains us, which means the love of God is the motivation for all of our work. And does our work contribute? Does it contribute to more than just myself? Number four, uh, this one would require a little bit of of thought, but um, (laughs) verse four, a little bit of irony here. Is it thoughtful? (laughs) Is my work thoughtful? Uh, this speaks to the integrity of my work. Is what I is what I do mindless, uh, or can I actually think about what I'm doing, being an expression of God's glory and me being made in His image? Is it a work of integrity? Romans twelve verse two: Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And so, what does the world say about work? center it around self, get what you want, do what you want. Um, it's a self-centered endeavor. So so if we are not to be conformed into that mindset, then we need to think about how our work can be centered around Jesus. The kingdom alternative for work is to put Jesus at the center, work for him and for his glory. And a work cannot be done for God's glory if Christ is not the center of of our focus and attention. Can I thoughtfully make Jesus the center of my work? Our concentration and reflection on life in Christ enables us to infuse even the most menial of tasks with divine breath, with divine inspiration, with meaning and with purpose. Meaningless jobs can actually become meaningful in Christ if we think about it with thought thoughtful reflection on scripture and prayerful reflection in Christ. We can bring the creativity that God gives us in our minds, bring it into reality through our work. Even if what you see what what you do seems to be kind of mindless, for example, um, there's people, my wife loves cleaning. I have no idea why. <laughs> um, but she loves cleaning. She loves to just work in that kind of way. It's actually kind of restful for her. Part of what she loves about it though is she likes to get in the zone and put on headphones. That even something like cleaning might seem meaningless, but for her it's meaningful because she gets to pray and dwell on thoughts of God uh, and, and listen to messages that encourage her and strengthen her. And then when she encounters people, she's been prayerfully built up so that she can be a blessing to them. Maybe, you, uh, maybe you're uh, in some kind of subcontracting work, like painting, and your job is just paint walls. Well, can you be creative about it? Can you be thoughtful about it? Can you listen to maybe sermons or listen to scripture while you're doing that? That kind of stuff can, be, can make your work that might seem meaningless to be very thoughtful. And, and your, the, the, your work being in, uh, a, from a place of integrity, that it, it is an expression of God's work in you and through you, but you gotta put the work into your thoughtfulness into it so that you're not conformed by the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does the world or the environment around you, what is the general mindset? If that's governed by the world, then you bring a new mindset to that, thoughtfully considering how Christ is present even in uh, an ungodly environment in your work. Deuteronomy 8, verse 17 and 18 says this. This is Moses warning the people of Israel before they go into the promised land. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So our work being thoughtful 
is that we think about how God gives us the power to create wealth, to make money, and why? So that we can heap it up on ourselves, so that we can keep it all for ourselves? No, we are able to get wealth for what? To confirm his covenant to extend the boundaries of God's covenant family, to extend the boundaries of God's kingdom, for to be a place where the kingdom of God comes through us. It's the reason why we tithe. We, we tithe 10% of our income, not because we're trying to pay God off. I'm thoughtfully considering how God gives me the power to make wealth, and that wealth, 100% of it is his but I set aside 10% to give to him that sanctifies the whole 100% because it all belongs to him. So my thoughtfulness in my work is how has God made me, shaped me, gifted me, and how can I bring this into my work? Even if the task seems meaningless, how can I impact people? Anybody who's in a frontline employee, a frontline employee, where you are the first point of contact for customers and clients. Buddy, you have a powerful job, and I'm sure it is very taxing. Is it thoughtful means, can you think about how to impact people, not just as customers and clients, but as people whom God loves, who Jesus died for, and you can be a witness to and show love to? God gives you the power to make wealth. Now, what we do with that is to confirm his covenant. Our jobs can be the place where God extends his kingdom. And then number five, and this can easily be a big rabbit hole, but I just wanna hit one little, one little piece of this. Number five, is your work balanced with rest? This speaks to the limitations of our work. Exodus chapter 20, verses eight to 11 uh, God is giving the Ten Commandments, and this is commandment number four. It's the longest commandment in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which is not the whole of that commandment. He goes on. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock or the sojourner with, who is in your gates. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The commandment here is not just to take a day off, but to sanctify a day of rest so that you can work for six days. Um, it is a six to one ratio of work to rest. It's not, hey, just take a big vacation. No, he says, do the things that are work in six days, but sanctify a day of rest, of communion with God, of fellowship with God, of not doing the things that extend your work. And that's not just specifically uh, paid work. Because there's lots of stuff we do in our lives that is work that we don't necessarily get paid for. Like household chores, uh, mowing the yard. I hate, hate, hate yard work. Gosh, I hate yard work. It's work. I will not do that on my Sabbath. I will not because it's work and I don't get paid for it. Um, there's lots of work like that, like paying the bills that ex expends our energy. Uh, it, it, it is something we're putting our hand to that requires us to be thoughtful, to be present to. And we need a day, a limitation on our work so that we can specifically pay attention to God, that we can not just have a day of leisure, but a day of communion and fellowship with God. And as much as I would love to teach on the Sabbath, on um, Sabbath as a practice, Sabbath as a principle, and then Sabbath as a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, who is our Sabbath rest, and talk about all that because usually when people start talking about the Sabbath, we're making, we're making an issue out of things that aren't an issue. Um, the, the, the point I wanna make here about our work is that you are not the Energizer Bunny. You cannot keep going and going and going and going and going and going. There have to be limitations on your work. And it isn't to say that if you're not working six days at your job, you're breaking the commandment. No, there's six days worth of work just being a human. Maybe your work 
uh, the way you do your work is necessary on four days. It isn't to say you take three days off. You take two days to do the kinds of work of everyday life, paying the bills, mowing the lawn, doing the laundry, things like that, that, that are part of work, not just our paid work. Our work needs boundaries. You cannot work 18 hours a day, every day, over and over and over. You're, you are not made for that. Just like you were made for work, you were made for rest. They work together. They are not one or the other. It's not a, an either or, it's a both and. Man was made for work and was made for rest. Um, it's stilling ourselves. Uh, that rest is about stilling ourselves, being still for the purpose of preparing ourselves for engagement in work the other six days. Sabbath is not relief from our vocations. It is the end which finds satisfaction in the work that has been done and then refilling ourselves for the work that shall be done. That's the principle you see in God sanctifying the Sabbath day, the seventh day, is it says he looked at all that he had made, enjoying what all that he had made. He says that is very good, that we take a day, at least a day, and we look at our work and say, is what we're doing good? Is what we're doing contributing? Is it honest? Is it thoughtful? Am I, am I doing my best? Am I bringing my best to my work? You can't do that when you're always working. And an age of technology is not helping. You've got to set boundaries in your work. The Sabbath was a day to be reminded that our lives and the life of God's people is not defined by our work. Our work is important, but it's not the center. Our lives are defined by our creator and our relationship with him. And our work is an outflow of obedience to him. He is the end of our work and the beginning of our work he is our ultimate go, goal. Jesus, he disrupts all the practices of the Pharisees. He didn't abolish the Sabbath. He abolishes the dead religious structure around Sabbath. And he says, come to me. Jesus was the perfect balance of work and rest, continually resting and continually working. He worked from a place of rest, not work for rest. As a matter of fact, on a Sabbath, Jesus in John chapter five, verse 17, he says, my father is working and I'm working. What was Jesus's work? Bringing heaven to earth, being a vessel of the kingdom of God, bringing life and vitality into the world of sin and death. He brought healing in brokenness and he had to do that by intimacy and fellowship with his father and working from that place of rest. And his answer to us is come to me. The holy day became a holy person that's available to us 24 seven. Back in Matthew chapter 11, let me read this in the Message Bible. It's a paraphrase of these verses, but I think this paraphrase hits it head on. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Listen, our world needs hope. Our world needs help. And there's lots of noble and worthy things that we work for. We don't find our identity in our work, in our job, in our title and positions of authority. We don't find our purpose in our work. We find all of that in Jesus. And in relationship with Jesus, in intimacy with Jesus, in restful relationship with him, the rest of our life comes out, flowing out of that as unforced rhythms of grace. That sounds beautiful. And it's what I want. And the only answer is not a new government program. It's not a new company. It's not anything else. It's not a new economy. 
it's Jesus. Our world needs Jesus. And our world needs people who have surrendered their life to Jesus, who live freely and lightly and witness of his power and for his glory. That's what we're all about. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna serve Jesus and surrender to Jesus. And if you need to surrender your life to Jesus, we invite you to do that now and to connect with us. And as a church, we're wholly and completely centered on Jesus and believe that it's Jesus that transforms our lives. And that's what we wanna connect you with. Let me pray for you and then I'll hand it over to the host. Father, I thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. I thank you that you've commissioned us and called us. Thank you that you have given us dignity and honor by allowing us to work. But our work is not our purpose. Our purpose is found in you and you alone. So may we rest in you. May we come to you, Jesus, to receive freedom, freedom from a slavery to selfishness, slavery to sin, slavery to our work, slavery to a lack of purpose. I thank you, Jesus, that you lead and guide us as a good shepherd. So may we continue to surrender our lives to you, to see you and in intimacy and fellowship with you, be transformed by you so that our lives bring glory to your name and bring hope to a world of despair, bring life to a world of death, bring light to a world of darkness. And I pray, Jesus, that you be glorified in and through us. And I pray all this in your name.